Name is Harold E. Hoover, that's H-O-O-V-E-R. No, commonly known as Hal, H-A-L. <laughs> okay, Hal. Uh, why don't you start by telling me, you know, how you got into the SED, how you happened to get into the SED, and then uh, what you found when you got to Oak Ridge. All right, I was under the ASTP program. Prior to that, I was in the or with the Ordnance Department as a hand and shoulder weapons instructor. I got into the ASTP pro program and sent to Penn State University uh, for, under civil engineering, although I was a chemical engineer. Uh, from the Penn State University, why I was assigned uh, and got orders to take off and head south. I didn't realize that I was coming to Knoxville where the orders read Chicago, but um, somehow or other things got mixed up and I came into Knoxville direct as a GI in uniform. Uh, there were a couple of whacks met me at the train station, took me out to the uh, army area, and then the orders were changed because I was supposed to have gone to Chicago and made a transition there into a civilian setup. So the WACs took me to the Hotel Farragut in downtown Knoxville, where I spent about two weeks uh, changing over from GI clothes to civilian clothes with a 4F card and uh, was sent out to Oak Ridge, the Tennessee Eastman Corporation, to apply for a job. Uh, became uh, a filter foreman at the Y-12 plant. And of course, this had been arranged uh, for about 12 to 15 of us who were in the counterintelligence corps to work as filter foreman in that project. Because back in the uh, early parts of 43, there had been a problem with the first unit that started in which it shorted out and they had to shut it down. At that time, they didn't know whether it was sabotage or whether it was a problem in construction or maybe something with uh, the constructing company might have left some metal or something in the oil cooling system that shorted out the track. So that developed a, a, a problem and uh, that's when they set up our counterintelligence group to come in, and that's the reason why everything was kind of messed up at the beginning on account of the urgency of it, uh, to come in, and that's where we spent the uh, Army service as filter foreman down at Y-12. The oil and water cooling systems were the very critical part of the operation because they had to maintain temperatures, and they had to keep foreign material out of the oil and out of the water. And so that's how I spent my Army career, as a filter foreman. Well, how did you like being in uh, counterintelligence? What, did that create some awkward moments? I, I don't know. To this day, I don't know how in the world. Uh, I have never hit the lotto. But by the same, same token, why I was picked out for some reason or other. And then talking with the other uh, men in the organization, that we our little organization, they could never figure out either why they were picked for this particular operation. Most of us were chemical engineers. And so that's how we ended up there. Can you explain, uh, or actually, when we have this on film, we're going to show you know, some of these classic photos of the uh, white 12 interior. Can you just uh, help, um, let's say, the, the viewer who is going to be looking at this film kind of walk them through what, what this plant looked like, what it felt to go to work inside the plant. Um, I have this picture, of this. you can talk about this picture, but why don't we start with the calutrons themselves and, mm -hmm. and, and how big they were and what it was like to be right there on the shop floor when they were operating. Yes, the, um, the buildings, uh, there were, they, they, we called them, went by dash buildings. They had a four number and then there was a dash, a dash one, dash two, dash three, and I was in dash five. And in the, uh, the first three buildings, why they had two tracks horizontally built uh, uh, on the one level. And in dash five, why they doubled up. They had one track over top of the other track. And uh, 
It had the same operation, only there was a duplicate track one above the other. And um, these tracks, uh, of course, uh, uh, were where the, the uranium ore was introduced and the electromagnetic current was introduced and under a vacuum. And that's where they, they were reduced down to U-235. And um, the, all of this, they had huge vacuum tubes because it had to be done in a vacuum. And the vacuum tubes were cooled by the water system. The tracks and the individual units all around the tracks, which were as large as a football field in length, and they were um, not a circle, but they were oblong in shape, and they had the electric control, controls up above and down below were all of the filtering systems, cooling systems, and what have you. And um, all of the filters in the, in the water system and the oil system had to be changed periodically. As the, they became contaminated by the temperature would rise, and if it went up above a certain temperature, you had to shut the unit down, and of course we didn't want that. So we uh, had a schedule in which we would continuously go around the track and uh, change filters. And uh, we perfected a system where we knew how long it had, just about how long it would take for the temperature to rise. So we were able to do away with two shifts and we did it all in one shift because we set up a schedule to change a certain number of filters around the track each day. And uh, that saved a lot of time and uh, also saved a lot of money because we were able to do with two crews. That uh, is about it as far as the operation. And how long is, uh, well, upstairs, or was it upstairs that they had the control panels? Yes, they had the cubicle, they called them cubicles, and, and they were up in the second story. Well, can you describe the cubicles? What, what did they look like? Well, they were just, a, just like an electronic control panel, solid wall, hallway, walk, walkway, and girls were operating those. And uh, they would monitor the, monitor the temperature and uh, the direction of the, of the uh, magnetic arc. And uh, they were actually uh, controlling the, the heart of the operation. It, uh, isn't it surprising that they trust girls with such responsibility? Uh, in my early days, I thought so, but then by the same token, can you start again? Because it, they won't hear my question. So you have to say, in the early days, I thought, you know, I wasn't sure about the girls taking control. Yes, well, I was just going to say that uh, women are much more uh, adaptable to that than men because I worked for the ordnance department before I went into the service. And uh, this plant made bullet cores for 30 caliber and 50 caliber machine guns. And they were doing all of the testing. And they could automatically do it without even thinking about it. They, with all of the gauges, and at the same time, carry on conversations with neighbors. And by the same token, if there was something wrong, they would just stop because things were not rolling along the way of war. These girls could watch these dials and what have you, and still be aware of what was going on around them. They, a man couldn't do that. They, they kind of wonder a bit. But women are. This I learned from the ordnance department, and that's the reason why they used women as inspectors. Because they could set up a, a routine, and they would follow it, and if there's something just happened to be wrong, they would automatically, instinctively feel it, and they, they could pick it out. So that, 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 is, that is my theory as to why they were chosen as operators. Do you, do you ever see, this is uh, Ed Wilcox's picture of the girls coming in from the plant gates, the Y-12 gate, you know, just at the mm -hmm. change of the shift, and you yes. see all women. Can you, if, if, if we show this picture on the screen, can you kind of describe what's happening there and make some comments on it? Well, they, they had the main gate to the plant, and you had, ex had to exchange badges. You had to have a badge in order to get in. And so therefore everyone had to came, come through the same place, just like turnstiles. And they had security guards there, and you did have to have a, a, it was a photo ID badge, and everyone had to have one of those to get in. So everybody went in and out of the same area. And uh, when uh, the shift was over, why you did have a large 
outflux of people and also a large influx of, of employees going in and out. Um, there's a picture in this book um, I had on a minute ago that has a picture of a little boy having his badge uh, inspected or issued a badge. At what age did um, children have to have a badge? That I'm afraid I don't know. Yeah, no. But children mm -hmm. did have to have badges, is that right? Well, in order to get into the Oak Ridge town site, or the Oak Ridge complex at all, everyone had to have a badge. And they had to be identified, and they had to, if they didn't have the badge, they couldn't get in. If you had a guest coming, a relative or, or a spouse, uh, they could not get onto the, the, the um, Oak Ridge, uh, through the Oak Ridge main gate, unless you had arranged for a pass for them to get there. And that didn't make any difference whether they had a husband inside or a wife inside working or what have you. They still couldn't get in unless the individual inside had made arrangements for them to come in as a visitor. And then they got a visitor badge. What about, um, talking about husbands and wives, what was, what was the social life like, especially for the 13,000 single people? Well, um, my understanding was that the average age in Oak Ridge when it was at the peak of the population was around 25 years old. And I believe the peak of the population was around 70 or 75,000, if I'm not mistaken. And it was the fifth largest uh, city in the state of Tennessee. They had uh, uh, social, social halls, cafeterias. Uh, they had dances. They had uh, um, various places around the town site. The, uh, they, they either were west, west part of town and the, and the regular town site was the original area. And then they had churches, of course, and had uh, social at the churches. It was just like any, any uh, regular city. The only thing was that everyone was very young. <laughs> um, looking back on it, um, do you remember when they announced that the war end, ended? You know, that picture that went. Westcott had of, of the uh, people holding up the newspapers that said war ends. That was, what do you remember of that day? Well, the, one of the things, one of the, the main things as far as I was concerned was the fact that we immediately received orders to put on our uniforms uh, because we had been civilians and uh, from that point on why uh, we wore uniforms uh, while I was a civilian working there uh, we lived in dormitories, and immediately upon getting the order to, to put on my uniform, there was no more dormitory. I had to move into the Army barracks and the uh, military detachment, as did the other fellows in our group. So our life as a civilian was over, and we were back into the military routine. <laughs> Complete with KP and all Well, no, I, I escaped that. <laughs> <laughs> no KP. So how many barracks were there in, uh, so you were in the dormitories. Here's a picture here. Is that a picture of dormitories or barracks? Or? These, were, these were dormitories. They had men's dormitories and women's dormitories. And um, in my case, why I had a roommate. Um, I believe there were... I don't know of any single rooms. I think it, they were all double rooms, to my recollection. And all of the fellows that were in our outfit lived in dormitories, not necessarily the same one, but uh, other dormitories that were around the area. Were the beds bunk beds? Uh, can you describe the room? Uh, it uh, was not that fancy. There was a desk and a chair in it, and then there were two bunk beds, one on either side of the room. and. Uh, you didn't have your own private bath. You had a community bath and a shower. And uh, they were very comfortable. And uh, they, they were just wooden, similar to a wooden barracks, only with a little more plush to them. What about the barracks then? When you got sent back to them, what were some of the things you might have missed about the dormitory? Uh, excuse me? Is it, were, were there, what was the, was there a big, a uh, difference between the barracks and the dorms? Well, you didn't have the privacy of the barracks. Uh, back into the Army life, you did not, you did not have a private room. 
there you uh, you were in a in a barracks. No no partitions or anything like that, and uh, you're back to the old army life. So how do you feel about having been part of this Manhattan Project? Well, uh, I, of course, by being in this, I did not experience any of the battles throughout the world, in Europe or the, the Pacific uh, Theater, and uh, I don't know how I would have done if I had been assigned to something else. Uh, what, as I said earlier, I did not know why I was chosen for this. Uh, having been a, a hand and shoulder weapon instructor in Aberdeen, Maryland, we had people come in from all units that had been in other areas of the, the war theater. And um, if they were going to Africa or if they were going to Europe or if they were going to in the Japanese or the Pacific theater, why we would teach them the, how to use a particular type of weapon that they might face, like German Mausers, uh, the, the differences in ammunition. So if they had an occasion that they did not have any of their own and they might have to use some captured weapons and what have you, they would know how to use them. And uh, following that, I was set up to be a first sergeant in an infantry outfit that was heading over seas. Before I could report to North Carolina to get that, I received orders to go to Georgetown University. And following Georgetown University, I was sent to Penn State. Now, all of this turning around, I do not know the reasons why or, or why, why the uh, Army would do that, unless possibly the fact that I had an engineering background and uh, they may have needed engineers at that time for this project. I never did find out why, but uh, that was what changed my career as far as a military man, from being in combat to being assigned to Oak Ridge. And after the war was over, you stayed in Oak Ridge. Right? Well, following the war, when I was discharged in um, February of 1946, I had already had a job at Y-12 as a civilian um, to come back after discharge in Fort McPherson, Georgia, why I came back and uh, worked in the f final phase of the chemical lab at Y-12 in which we processed the final product prior to it going to Los Alamos. And uh, so I worked there for oh, just about a year, up until the time that they closed down the operation. And that was, that was an interesting experience too. When was that? When did they do that? Uh, I think they did that in about March of, uh, of uh, 46. No, I mean, that's when I started to work there. 47 is when they closed it down. Hmm. And of course, I got married in, in May of 46. And she was an Oak Ridge gal too, Y-12 girl. She was from Oklahoma, but we met in Oak Ridge. The dances? At one of the dances? No, uh, I had known her personally uh, for about a year, but she didn't know me because I was a civilian and I had not put on my uniform yet. But she walked past my office every day because she worked for the electrical department and she uh, carried communications from the headquarters down to the various divisions and different departments. And she also was a, um, she drove a, one of the army cars. She would pick up dignitaries at the railroad station or the airport and bring them in and take them back. And um, following the war and after I got my uniform on, they were having a beauty contest in Oak Ridge. And the personnel, head of the personnel, she came to me and asked whether I could help in supplying GIs for as escorts for the beauty contest contestants. And I told her under one condition that I knew that my future wife was going to be one of the contestants and uh, I said I wanted to be her escort. And under those conditions, why we would see what we could do about supplying a GI, we did. 
I got that's how I got acquainted with her, and we got married then in May of '46. And she was the runner-up of. Yes, she was the runner-up of, of her title? Miss Atomic Bomb. She was the first runner-up, and our pictures appeared on the New York Mirror, front page of the New York Mirror, the Knoxville News Sentinel, and uh, the Oak Ridge Journal, and so uh, she still has those pictures. Uh, so this is obviously after the bomb. Yes. Yeah. And in 46, 45? That was in 45. Um, that, that was immediately after the war was over. Mm -hmm. 